Hello and uh, welcome to Funk Prog Sweden 7. We are back after a short summer break during July, during the Swedish summer. And as always, we would like to thank and our recurring uh, members that are joining this meetup. We would also like to welcome new participants in this meetup. This is Funk Prog Sweden. The meetup where we explore functional programming and functional programming languages such as Erlang, Elixir, Clojure, Scala and more. And not to say, we're not just exploring functional programming languages, we're also exploring functional programming in other languages and concepts. And today we will have one presentation in functional programming in C Sharp. So, let's head over to the agenda. So today we'll do a short intro by me, Magnus Sedlacek. And then we hear Down the Oregon Trail with Functional C Sharp by Simon Painter. And then unfortunately, um, our next pres presenter got ill. So we'll only do one presentation this time. And he will be back in a later meetup in the coming months. And then when the first presentation is done, I'll do a short schedule and summary of the meetup. So, first up, I would like to thank our video sponsor, Adabeat. Adabeat is an IT consulting company with offices in Stockholm and in Ho Chi Minh City, where most of the developers are doing functional programming. If you want to know more about Adabeat, check them out on the web or in social media. And if you want to support the Funkprog Sweden meetup, you can do that by joining the meetup community. Or you can follow us and subscribe in the YouTube channel. And of course, you can get one of these t-shirts that I'm wearing in the Funkprog Sweden MySpread shop. So head over to the shop to see what you can buy. There's also coffee cups and all sorts of merchandise. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the YouTube chat. Just sh shoot away questions and I will, um, I will interrupt the presenters and, and shout it to them. So with that said, let's start and uh, welcome to Funk Prog Sweden. Second time, Hello. Simon, welcome. Hello. If for some reason he didn't get scare, uh, scared of inviting me back again, but here I am. Hey, everyone. <laughs> no, we, we enjoyed your first presentation, so welcome back. And this time uh, around, you're going to do a, a classical game. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah? I've been, I spent, uh, I mean, like most of us, I've spent the last couple of years not going out for, for, for some reason. And um, <laughs> I thought I needed some projects I need because I am a colossal nerd. And being a colossal nerd, I like to keep busy. Yep. So I picked up a few things to do. The one is, I don't know if you can see my piano back there. There we go. Um, I've been teaching myself to draw, hence uh, the the, uh, the picture you see here. I drew that. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, got myself an iPad and this thing. Yeah, it's, it's not great, but hey, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. It uh, certainly saves me a lot of money from paying anyone to do these things. Yep. So, um, and the other thing I thought I would do is find some sort of project to keep myself going uh, with regards to the old functional programming and mm. finding excuses to do more C sharp that way. So mm. this is kind of what this uh, this talk is is themed around, and um, some of the new stuff I've started doing there. This uh, this link incidentally is from my Twitter account. So if anyone would like to follow me for for some inexplicable reason, feel free. Drop me a mm. drop me a follow. Ooh. I'm fairly chatty, so. Uh, apologies, I talk nerdy stuff quite a lot. Really nice. Welcome again, and the stage is yours. Cheers. Right. So now I am guessing that potentially I don't really need to do this slide particularly. This talk is meant for a more general audience, so I'm guessing most of your folks or will already be well aware of what on earth what the, this functional programming lark is all about. So um, I'm I'm just going to skip this one, and if anyone has any objections. So, and possibly this one too. I suspect if you've come this far that you're watching um, watching this lovely uh, event, then you're probably already up for why it's why functional programming is a good idea. So once again, I'll skip. But 
this one is a little bit more pertinent, and that is something of uh, something I've come across more and more as I've gone deeper into doing um, functional C sharp, and that's that's the idea that there is only so far you can go. This this is a diagram, by the way, um, of of shadows. There are theoretically two parts of a shadow. Actually, there's about twelve. This is something I've learned since I've started drawing, but for the purposes of my explanation, there are only two. Um, there's the the dark solid bit that's the the umbra and the gray shady bit around the outside all shadows have these if you have a look at them and that's the pen umbra and c sharp fundamentally cannot do everything that a, a pure functional language can do there are always going to be places where a compromise needs to be made so that's one of the themes of this talk is there are one or two places where we just simply have to make a compromise and the other is that whenever I am programming C sharp functionally, my aim is to try and maximize our A area there, our dark umbra piece, our purely functional area, and to minimize and push out to the fringes the, the compromise area where we have to interface with something else or, or, or something of that sort. There's one or two other places too. So I'll, there'll be one or two places in this talk where I've had to compromise somewhere and I'll point it out. But that's that's the that's the idea of what I'm trying to achieve, though, is make C sharp as functional as it can be, but just acknowledge once in a while um, areas where it simply isn't possible for one reason or another. You, know, you cannot, for example, um, have uh, um, uh, variables that literally can't ever be set everywhere in C sharp. Uh, it's just it's just not possible. There's always going to be some area of, you can you can push that boundary as far as you gives you like, but there's always going to be a place where you have to make a compromise. So, so moving on to what my the uh, the game is about. The Oregon Trail is the game. It's from it's quite an oldie and it's set initially in a historical period in America. Now I'm going to be honest. Until I started investigating this game, I'd never even heard of Oregon. Apologies if anyone's from there who's watching this but i hadn't i don't know an awful lot about american history but there it is that is oregon at the top there just beneath uh, washington state and above california and uh, the game i think i think it's set in something like the 1700s or 1800s something like that i actually found it from a list of a great big book called the thousand and one games you should play before you die or something like that and it mentioned it as one of the first great computer games uh, that had ever been made um and here's a bit more of Oregon. See, that's that's the scenery. That's one of the things Oregon's known for, isn't it lovely? Now, I don't know whether there are any meetups uh, or any conferences in Oregon, but if any of them are listening and would like to pay for me to come out and then see, you know, I wouldn't say no. It looks quite nice. They're also famous for, for Nike, the, the uh, sportswear brand. This is named for anyone that's curious after the goddess of victory from ancient Greece. And I had no idea, but there you go. It has to come from somewhere, I suppose, and where it comes from is, is Oregon. And also, does anybody remember the old 1980s film, The Goonies? I certainly do. That's how old I am. Um, well, apparently this is where it was set, uh, in a part of Oregon called The Goondocks, hence the, the name there, The Goonies. Uh, awesome film. That I'm just waiting until my kids are a little older so I can show it to them. I still think it might be a little scary. The, the oldest is uh, is eight, the youngest six. So I think possibly not quite ready for this yet. And this is the legend of the Oregon Trail. This is uh, covered wagons making their way across the plains of America from one side to the other with uh, oxen carts pulling them along through these idyllic, beautiful um, plains. Uh, looks awfully nice, but uh, uh, it might be a little rougher than that it looks from this painting as we'll find out as I get into the game and this is the Oregon Trail this is what it looks like it's moving from the uh, west uh, east coast going towards the west from the the roots of the Missouri River over uh, we go. let's play ah there it is my mouse there we go down here across America and out into Oregon itself as I understand it, the thinking was that there were an awful lot more opportunities for, for land and for prosperity over in Oregon, and that's why people were making their way um, all the way over there. The routes were set up by fur traders and uh, trappers and things like that, and I think it started off as a series of little trade routes that all joined up until it became one long continuous route. Uh, there's a couple of features of it. One is the South Pass, so one, if, I, if we can see it on this there we go, right at the end, 
we've got ourselves a great big mountain range, the, got the blue mountains here. And uh, this is one of the last things that has to be passed. And this is part of uh, what goes on in the game. Uh, but there was a South Pass found, which was a relatively safe place to, uh, to, to pass to. And if you can see here as well, that's another fact aspect is hunting because you can't actually put enough food in these covered wagons to last you for the entire journey. So hunting has to be done along the way. And there's a little mini game in the game for that. And forts were dotted all the way along. Um, and that's a place where trading and all the like can, can happen to, to buy more supplies as you're going around. And this was the, the principle the, uh, the game was based around. But before I get to the game itself, first I wanted to talk briefly about the origins of of where the actual environment came from to, to, to make it. And it starts with this gentleman. His name is John Kemney. He was a Hungarian mathematician. And from what I've read, quite a genius at it. Uh, if, I don't know if anyone's ever heard uh, it said that Albert Einstein wasn't very good at calculus. Well, he's the guy that said it. It's him. He was also he worked as a research assistant for Einstein and he was a human computer working with uh, Richard Feynman, another very famous, very illustrious physicist. And amongst all of his various jobs, he ended up as um, head of mathematics at uh, Dartmouth, is it Dartmouth, Dartmouth University in, uh, in America. And it was in that capacity that he got rather obsessed with the idea of computers. And this is, we're talking the 1960s, late 60s at the moment, I believe, uh, late 60s, early 70s. And at this point, he'd already decided that computers were the way forward. Not only that, but he wanted everybody to have an opportunity to, uh, to play with computers. So he started a couple of initiatives away to try and aid that, uh, that goal, to try and bring everyone on board with the use of computers. And he teamed up with this, this chap you see on the left there next to him, that's uh, Thomas Kutz. And between the two of them, they came up with two very interesting ideas. And one of them was the concept of time sharing. So in those days, the, the computer was a massive, great basement filling behemoth. And if you wanted to put a program into it, then you, you handed over your little um, punch tape to, to somebody who ran it. They would bundle up all of the punch tapes they've got by the end of a, a week or a fortnight and then feed them into the computer one at a time, record the output and pass it back to you. That was done in batches, hence batch processing. That's where it comes from. The original batch processes was punch cards being fed into a giant machine. So time sharing got around this by having only a single computer, but terminals available all across the campus. And the computer would share its time between each terminal, giving everybody the illusion that they were all interacting with a computer that was in front of them, when in fact, really, they weren't. It was just sharing its time between, between all of them. And the other was a programming language. There were other programming languages around at the time and in use. There was uh, Fortran, I think, was one of the popular ones. We've got COBOL. But they thought none of these were good for a beginner, which is what they wanted, a programming language that absolutely anybody could use, a beginner's programming, uh, programming language. And they called it the Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code, or BASIC. There's a bit of BASIC. Now, this was actually my very first programming language because again i'm that old but uh there used to be uh books published here in the uk by a publishing company called usborne of basic programs that you could sit there into your computer and type in yourself and there would be these lovely you know oil painted pictures of aliens and spaceships and battles and you'd sit there for you know an evening type in the code in press run and it was all like make a guess at the, the answer you were wrong try again you were right well done that was about as good as it got but hey it kept me entertained when i was eight years old or whatever i was and uh i oh, i'd normally ask an audience at this point but um i don't know whether anybody's thinking that this particular program is a very good idea to to enter into a terminal it's not uh this was one of the many problems of basic every line had to have a line number and you could literally go to line numbers. So this would run this line. Then this one says go to 10. So what you've got here is an infinite loop. And um, 
the other thing is that these were run off of teleprinters. Uh, so when it said print, it meant it. It was printing. Uh, it was actually a policy of the original basic code that every single line had to start after the line number with a verb. The idea was that the coder was forced to write something relatively descriptive that uh, that showed precisely what the line of code did, had print, go to. In fact, even the assignment of variables couldn't be done uh, simply with an assignment. You had to use a let keyword to assign a variable of value. That's where let comes from, by the way. We have this, we, this has actually been restored to us in uh, JavaScript these days, and there may be other languages that use it, I don't know. There was another interesting um, feature that they introduced into basic, which believe it or not, was controversial at the time. The keyword input. There was a lot of folks at the time that were saying, why would you do that? Why would you stop the um, computer from executing in order to receive some input from the user and then carry on? Why wouldn't you expect all of the parameters at the start and then let the computer do its thing and give you an answer back? Uh, this, is, this is the idea of computers as maths guide and uh, math tools, that sort of thing. But no, they wanted input. And so it entered into the basic language. And of course, what happens then is everyone goes and makes games, which is exactly what happened. There were hundreds of them coming out of the campus. Uh, apparently, one of the very popular ones was a computer simulation, text only, by the way, of American football, complete with a, a flipping of a coin and uh, various other things. I don't know. I, have not, uh, I didn't manage to find the source code for that one. If anyone knows of it, let me know. There was another one based entirely around space battles in Star Trek. Now, that one looks like a great deal of fun. I might look into that one. This is a timeshare terminal. Now, notice that what this basically looks like is a keyboard and a printer, and that's roughly what it is. Uh, you've got your keyboard there for your user input and a printer for printing out the output. Like I said, when it said print, meant it. It was printing. There was no live terminal back in those days. So then we move on to a campus in Minnesota. And these three gentlemen were... Uh, student teachers and they were teaching a course about the Oregon Trail and they thought wouldn't it be a good idea to try and get everyone learning in a fun way by um, making a computer game which is what they did uh, he's holding a, a copy of the source code there in his hand not that we can read it particularly but there we go in this is in 1971 they sat down and made a text-based game about the Oregon Trail, about making your way from wherever it is you start along the trail, random encounters. Um, there was a, a fighting a mini game. There were all sorts of other little bits and pieces. It was quite a for its time, bearing in mind when it was made, it was quite a sophisticated product. Now, the original 1971 version is lost to us. Uh, they didn't, it was there on campus, it rapidly became one of the most popular games of the year, but it was wiped at the end of the uh, academic year and to, it is lost to posterity. But in 1975, these folks were approached by an educational company in Minnesota who wanted their own version to release commercially. And this is the version which they created from memory and apparently an improvement on the original. This is the version that we have the source code to. It's out on the internet. You can all go and look it up if you want. Um, and when running on a terminal, because I don't happen to have a, an HP timeshare basic um, terminal about my person, uh, but this is roughly what it would look like if you were running it on, a, on, a, on, on an actual live terminal. Again, it's entirely text-based. What it's doing is prompting the player um, for, for a, a choice and then taking the input, parsing it and, uh, and doing whatever. Most of the input is integer based, either a selection of one of the choices or a quantity, but not exclusively. There are one or two places where it's not integer based. Um, and then the, the computer will, will feed back. And there's, there are various probability curves at work that determine what sort of random event should happen at this point. Are we passing mountains? How far into the wilderness are we? It was, it was surprisingly complicated. 
And this is the rough turn structure of the game. You start by making your uh, initial purchases, which are things like oxen to pull your cart, um, food, uh, miscellaneous supplies, which is called that throughout the whole code base, but looking at it, it's medical supplies. And I don't know why they didn't change that, but fine. Uh, and various other things, bullets. Bullets, of course, because uh, we need to be able to shoot them by the folks that are trying to uh, steal our wagon or whatever. Then we begin a loop, which will go around until either a certain predetermined distance is reached or a certain number of uh, days has passed each. In fact, each turn roughly represents a week of game time. Uh, beneath that, you've got a choice, which is either to go hunting, visit a fort, which actually only appear every other week, or just continue without doing anything. And then there's a series of random events that have to be handled. There may or may not be riders on the trail ahead who may or may not be friendly. Uh, there's a set of just literally random events. The infamous one, by the way, which everyone seems to bring up whenever I mention Oregon Trail is dying of dysentery. In fact, the 1975 version doesn't have the concept of dysentery. There are only two things you can die of in this game, uh, injuries or pneumonia. So cheering, but only those two. Then finally, there's a gate to say, have we reached the mountains? If so, there's a whole load of other random events to be gone through. And then finally a check, have we reached Oregon? If so, you get the super duper special ending, which, you know, obviously is text based. So set your expectations or alternatively, we uh, loop back to the beginning of the turn to have another go. So that's what it looked like. Now, of course, I only know that because I spent months staring at basic code and making sense of it because basic code doesn't have objects. It doesn't have classes. It doesn't have modules. It doesn't even have files. Every basic application in those days was literally one file containing the entire source of the game so even it doesn't even have functions there are no concept exactly of functions the way we understand them in basic there's just lines which we arbitrarily designate as the beginning of a function and then go to them so here's what a bit of basic looks like now i've put the colors in to make this easier to read there are no colors in actual basic it's literally text but uh, this is roughly what it looks like. We've got our line numbers and our com uh, commands. Now, rem here. Rem is an interesting one. Again, bearing in mind the principle that we have to have um, uh, a verb in everything, it's short for remark. So this is a comment. Even comments have to have a verb associated with them because cool, why not? Uh, and luckily there's even a section at the end where they, uh, they explain what all the variables are because yeah, so here we go. Printing, do you need instructions? Now, DIM is defining an array, and I think this exists in uh, VB script and possibly VB, uh, VB6 and so on itself. So that's defining an array. It's actually a string. Uh, there's no concept of strings exactly in basic, not in this version of basic. There are many basics. It's just kind of, you have to define an array and this is text input stored in an array from the user, which you can then treat as a string here. So what this is saying is, do you need instructions? Uh, input that into C string. Uh, string here, that's how this dollar sign is pronounced. It's pronounced string. I don't know why, but this indicates that it's a string. And if it is equal to no, then 400, that is skip all of this section. Otherwise, we're going to print all the instructions. So really speaking, that's a bug. If, if I were to type um, dunno, then I'd still get the instructions. It's it's no to skip or anything else whatsoever to uh, to get the instructions. But hey, it was written in 1975 under fairly in a fairly crude environment. These are the rems at the end, by the way, which define what all of the uh, variables used in the thing mean. Now, for some reason, in basic, there is this Simon? policy. Oh, hello. Yeah, sorry, I have a question. What happens if you input six characters? Is that possible? Input six. Uh, you that's said, a, oh, oh or will that's you a be really out good of, question. Uh, out of memory or weird stuff or nothing happens. That's, the... Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know. <laughs> I could see two ways that could end. Yeah. My my best guess would be that if I was to what's a six letter word that's safe for a family audience. Uh, I don't know, let's say I type the word computer in there. That's P-U-T. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay, I'm gonna type the word computer in there. I would guess it'll take the first five characters, but that's a guess, I'm gonna be honest. Mm -hmm. Now, 
I did used to do basic programming as a kid, mm-hmm. but yeah, it too. was quite. But I don't remember because I haven't done this since the early nineties. So interesting question. I'm going to look into that. No, I'd be interested to know myself. So apologies, I can't give you a definitive answer. But uh, I want one, I mean, one more, one more oh, question. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> Is everything written in one file? Is this like a massive file and everything is one? I haven't yeah. checked this up myself, but it's one massive yeah. file and you just it's jump around. It's one massive it. file. Oh my yeah. God. I'm not, I mean, this would have, in the day, in 1975, this would have been stored on a mainframe mm-hmm. and you would have loaded from the mainframe, but the concept of files didn't exactly exist. Mm. It was more like, here's this thing saved in the mainframe, mm. load into working memory, mm. and the working memory is this source code, and that's yeah. it. And you scroll up and down. And... Yeah, yeah. It was about, well, I mean, you can see, because this comes from the end here, mm. it was uh, nearly 5,000 lines long. One single, five, nearly 5,000 long code file, no functions, no modules, no classes. It took me a while to work out what in heck it did, I'll be honest. Uh, it is not, it, it does not lend itself well to, um, to being understood. And it's made worse because if you look here at this if, you've got an awful lot of stuff where the if is actually working the opposite of what you think it ought to be. It's often, so this is saying, if I don't want the instructions, then do this. Whereas in a modern language, we'd be more inclined to write, if you want the instructions, here are the instructions. This is always tends Reverse. to be the opposite in basic. If you don't want, then I shall skip ahead. Not if I want, then do this block. So I had to stare at some of this for quite a long time to try and make sure I'd understood the sort of the weird double negative um, implications of some of the code. Mm. So this is mostly for fun, by the way, folks. Don't think this is in any way going to benefit your work. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I find this really interesting. Yep. And I spent half a year working on this, so you are going to pay attention. <laughs> so uh, yeah, please yeah. go. On. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I am happy to for questions, folks. I do like a nice interactive audience. So jump in anytime you feel for uh, your fancy. Plus, we don't have a second speaker, so let's take it easy. Um, think think of it as being like the last day of school. We're all just going to uh, slob around and do what we like. Right. Yeah, the other odd now, I've never known whether this was a policy, whether there's a meaning reason for this, but this is pretty consistent. In basic programmings, programming, uh, you always tend to have a variable name, which is only a couple of characters long, like this. C1, C3. There is no uh, D1, D3. Now, notice there's no D2. I don't know. Probably they decided it wasn't uh, D2, whatever it was, was a waste of time. So they, they just deleted it. And it is so hard to do edit basic programs. They probably thought it was too much work because you can't delete lines in basic exactly. You, you have to go and overwrite a line by scrolling up, finding the line and deleting it or, then, or, or replacing it with something else or inserting lines in between two lines exist by working out what's the diff. So if I wanted to insert D2, I would have to start with a new input line and say 4917 type rem D2 equals, and then, yeah, that would insert it in the right place. It's, it's, it's not friendly. So if you guys ever start feeling frustrated with whichever IDE you work in, it can be worse. So this is where I get into my actual design. So the first thing is, I want some interaction with my with my player. Now, weirdly, I am so used to, because uh, I've been doing uh, C-sharp development for about ooh, 16 years now or so, and I am so used to referring to whoever's sitting with the mouse and the keyboard as the user that it took me an awfully long time, far longer than it should have, to be able to remind myself constantly to say, player, because they're players, they're not users. See, look, look at the happy smile on his face, see? He's a player. He's he's happy because he's playing or she is playing um, Oregon Trail because it's that much fun. But the first thing I need to represent is one of those fuzzy gray areas of the system where I have to compromise. Um, I've got to take a user into a uh, see, see, see how easy that is. I have to take a player interaction. And there's nothing more impure than a human being. There is no way to wrap a human being into a pure function. So I am going to have to, to create some sort of airlock 
between the outside world and the inside world of my, my purely functional system. And I'm interacting with Windows through the command uh, through the uh, command prompt. So the first thing I need to do is create an interface because I'm a good guy and I'm going to do um, I'm going to do test driven development because because you know I'm a nice person. So that's fine. That's the easy bit first. But still, I need to wrap this behavior up. And uh, this is going to go through uh, via the uh, the interface from the console and into my turn engine. The turn engine is the thing that, that actually takes the input and decides what to do with it. So there are, if you think about it, three states that could come out of the console. This is loosely, but now I can say this because you guys are a functional audience, but uh, this is very loosely based on the, the, um, the maybe monad, but it's not really a monad. I'm not using it like a monad in this talk. There are other talks I do where I do exactly that, but for time being, what I'm using this is, uh, is something to represent our different states. Uh, there could be a something, there could be nothing, as in the user just put the, the player just pressed enter or an error occurred. I don't know if it can actually get an error coming out of the console like that, but still it could happen. And I need to I need to represent it so that uh, we know what happened. And there's how I do this in C sharp. So uh, this, um, again, I could probably ought to be setting my expectations, my audience a little, but you guys will probably know this is a uh, discriminated union. Um, and this, this is how I do my maybe discriminated union. I create a, an abstract base class taking a generic and I'd inherit off that multiple times. Once with nothing, which doesn't add anything to it, but it represents the fact that nothing happened and so there are no properties. Uh, where something happened, in which case we have a value and I'm forcing you to fill it in that value. Actually, I probably should set that to init or private read or, or private set or something. But, uh, and an error which represents an error occurred so i'll capture the error and, and uh, return that back and there's how my read line might now look so i'll put a try catch around the whole thing to represent that presumably an error could occur of some description i don't know maybe a low level memory exception or something you can't rule it out and take that put it into result if it's a null or a white space, then we'll return a nothing. Otherwise, we'll return a something. If an error occurred in the catch, then we'll return the error result. That's great. This means when we're using this thing in my, this console represents my console object, which wraps the, the, the real console. Uh, that means I can do um, a pattern matching statement on it. Now, an annoying thing that I can't really get rid of is this is moaning here. The reason this is moaning is I haven't got a default. And, I don't want one. Now, I happen to know because I wrote this, that something, nothing and error are the only possibilities that exist. So I, I don't see a problem. It's just I have to deal with this annoying underlying thing. But, uh, but that means that if I've got something then I can put the value out and nothing and you don't bother to take anything from this or an error in which case we display. Great. That is a lovely, elegant way of handling user input. But there is a little more to user input in my game and that is that occasionally we want text, but mostly we want an integer. So, oh yeah, and uh, also, sorry, I forgot the order. Yeah, and also we need to handle read-only, uh, to handle void returns. So I created something called an operation uh, discriminated union class. So start with operation and inherit that with success. Success meaning it, it worked, so there's nothing further to be worried about here, or it failed, in which case we'll capture the error again. And there we go. And that means I created an, um, uh, an extension method, uh, which attached to a generic. When you attach an extension method to a generic, that means it attaches to literally everything. So that means given this variable, whatever it is, um, you give me an action and it is run here. And this line assumes that there were no errors generated by the action, in which case well, success will be returned. Otherwise, an error occurred and we went into the catch, in which case we'll return failure. It means I don't have to fill my, uh, my code base with tries and catches all over the place because they're, they're messy. I don't like them very much. And that's what my right line looks like. It's take the message, which is a params, params, I'm hoping everyone's right, params just meaning you don't have to bother creating a new array on the other side. Uh, so it's a set of messages. And yeah, here we go. We have to do a for each here because there is no way to um, to write an array to uh, the console in C sharp. And I don't really know of any other way to do this other than for each. So for each it is. But this is on the fringes of the system. 
This is a little low level function that it just exists to interact with the outside world. So this is not entirely functional, but it's fine. It's absolutely fine because it's it's pushing that non-functional area to the, uh, the edge of the system. But this is actually how I want to represent the the user input coming back from the uh, from the player and into the game engine. I want to create another layer on top of that. Now, error is still error. That's fine. If there's an error here, I want an error. If there's a nothing, well, what am I going to do? Then fine, it's still nothing. But if there was something, if there actually was something return out of it, I want to split that further into uh, it was text or it was an integer because that could be pertinent. Um, to what I'm trying to do. If, you, if you're expecting a, a value to, and if you're expecting an integer value back to tell you how many oxen you wanted to buy, and you typed in five, F-I-V-E, that's not a lot of use because I haven't, I haven't written that particular bit of functionality. So that's relevant to my, um, to my parsing for, uh, for responding to the layer's input. So there we go. An extra layer is, is what I thought would save me an awful lot of time trying to check for integer types all over the flaming system. And that's what this looks like. So I've created another discriminated union. This time it's called user input. So I should call it player input. Um, and we've got empty. We've got this was text, in which case there's a string. This was an integer, in which case it was an integer. And it was an error, in which case it's an error. Now, I would love it if we had true um, discriminated unions the way that the F-sharp folks do. But so far as I'm aware, there are absolutely no plans to introduce discriminated unions natively into C-sharp. It's just the way it is. This is not in any way a perfect solution, but it will do. It is usable. It's still an awful lot more elegant than not doing this, in my opinion. So that means I finally got uh, a get input at the end. And this is the final step of sanitizing the uh, the input that's come from the from the player from the console and pumping it into the game engine but in a form that makes logical sense so uh, take the the prompt is whatever the the game at this point wants to say to the user it might be something like um, how many oxen do you want to buy we'll write that to the console using a write result which uh, into write result here which is um, uh, an operation so that could be a success or a failure or switch on this if it was not a failure then we'll read from the console and then here we'll take that return hi simon i have one more question why yeah, not go the record instead of a union um well forgive the well okay so i could i do to be honest, I do largely use records. Or a, a record doesn't still give you the discriminated union feature of the the sort of the the type the the type that contains many types, like a discriminated union does. So I could change all of these from classes to records, and I'd have no issue there. But um, uh, if otherwise, I'm not aware that record has that feature. I mean, record. I I'll be. I believe I've got a record coming up in a little bit, and there's no reason. Well. Actually, I don't want to replace these, strictly speaking. I want these to stay uh, stay as they are. But um, record is brilliant for capturing state, and that's largely what I use it for later. I'm probably calling this a class because I've spent 15 years writing classes for everything. But uh, there's definitely places where I would use records. But for creating a sort of simulation of a discriminated union, I'm not sure that's necessarily the place that there's a special benefit to be had. Um, but absolutely, I, I'll, I, I think uh, I think there will be an example of a use of record in a bit. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if it wasn't a failure, then we'll do a read line, and um, and that that is checking here to say, given it was a something when int dot try parse, that is try to parse it from whatever string value it was into an integer, and if it succeeds, this returns true. So if that returns true, therefore, it was guaranteed to be an integer. Therefore, integer input is returned containing the parsed integer, which I can now parse, trusting that it was a true integer. Otherwise, it wasn't an integer, in which case uh, 
we're going to do a check to see was it null or white space. So long as it wasn't null or white space, then I'm going to return it. So if this one hits, that means whatever it was couldn't be rendered as an integer, but it also wasn't empty. Therefore, it's this one. And this one is uh, the error. Otherwise, I'm just going to say it was empty because there's nothing else left, to be honest. And goodness me, imagine how much time it would take to write that out any other way. Take ages. Um, so there we go. That is stage by stage. I have gone from the impure, raw concept of a player who is a human being mashing the keys with their hands um, to capturing whether they entered anything at all or just hit enter or some sort of error occurred. And then we're taking this on a stage further to say, OK, now that we've got some sort of input from the player, render it in a form that is logically meaningful to the system. And that is that it was either an integer or a string is what's relevant to us here, which is why I've done this two stage effect. And now it has been sanitized to the point that I can actually pass this into my system and it should be usable without side effects from this point onwards. And this is, this is my representation of those first few lines. And I'm gonna say, get an input, do you need instructions? And um, there we go, the display instructions is, so I'm rendering this now into uh, a Boolean. So given it was a text and the text equals yes, I had to convert to two up because they might have typed Y yes, lowercase, then true, otherwise it was false. And that's that's my nice new nifty version of that first block. And then there we go, write out the uh, write the message. This is just, I've created a user interaction class, which is the thing that wraps all of that interaction with the well, the player um, in a safe manner. So and then I'll just write out those lines. Easy peasy. I did, for the sake of making it a little bit more functional, create um, an additional operator uh, function called write message conditional so that I don't have to use if statements. Uh, and I just said write message conditional, meaning I can pass it a bool to say whether or not you should write and then a list of whatever. So and it's just a little save and it means I don't have to use an if statement. So it makes it just a little bit more functional. This then is uh, my final version of that particular block. So get the input, do they want it? If it was yes, then true. If it was anything else than false, write message conditional. So there we go, nice, neat, functional code representing that first block that you saw from the basic. And honestly, an awful lot easier to read, but hey, those guys again wrote it in 1975, we have to bear in mind. So inventory, this is one of the major parts of the state. Now we talked about records, there we go, record. See, told you we'd have one. And most of the classes from this point on are gonna be records. I say classes, not exactly a class, but. Um, I, I don't know how familiar everyone is with F sharp, with, um, with C sharp, but a record is kind of like a class, except uh, I think it's passed by value and not by reference. And you can create copies of it using a really nifty, neat little syntax where you just say, I wanna make a new one of these. that's exactly the same as the old one. Then you can use the with keyword to say make it this one with food is modified and everything else is the same it just makes it so much easier to be functional without having to create huge blocks of boilerplate every time you want to create an object and it gets around that problem of what if i create a new property now i'm going to go to every single place it's referenced and make sure the new property is passed around as well so it saves a lot i love record types they are one of my very favorite things in c sharp since the last favorite thing I had uh, was probably pattern matching and probably link before that. So I'm creating a, a manage inventory uh, class, which is from an environment interface to get the initial inventory. That's your, that's your initial spend on each of these things. This one miscellaneous, as I say, is actually medical supplies, but I've tried to keep to the spirit of the original game. So I'm, to an extent I'm using their terminology, although I draw the line at like two character variable names. I'm not doing that. So I've given them meaningful names. Uh, I don't know whether it was a memory saving exercise in basic or, or what it was, but it's not a practice I care to follow. And this is actually what the initial spend, um, getting the initial spends code looks like roughly this. It's actually a series of loops 
really. Actually, it's oxen. Uh, I haven't written the entirety of the loop out just to stop this diagram from going crazy. But so first we go with oxen. It says, how many oxen do you want? If it's not, if it's less than 200, we say not enough. If it's greater than 300, too much. If it's, if it meets these criteria, then we'll go on. Otherwise, carry on looping back again and again and again and again until we get an answer finally that we accept. It's a little bit like my kids when the question is, can we have an ice cream? Just keep on asking until finally you get the answer that you're satisfied with, which is yes, ice cream. Uh, coincidence, I can hear an ice cream van. I don't know if that's coming out on the recording. Okay, and then having done that, we move to food, where the only criteria is that it should be greater than zero. Um, then ammo, again, same thing. Clothes, same thing. Miscellaneous supplies, same thing. Finally, there is an over loop. So we take all the spends individually, all of these, add them together. If you've spent more than $700, then you've overspent, and we've got to do the whole thing all over again. Fantastic. It's a little tedious until you decide finally what your, your optimum spend on everything should be, in which case you can blaster it. Incidentally, in case anyone ever wants to try this, uh, 200 oxen and 100 everything else sees me through to the end of the game, no trouble. You are welcome. So I need to represent this in as functional a manner as I can. There we go. I've created a... Um, a get input, uh, a, a, a loop here to, to get my spend on oxen. Now, unfortunately, uh, we've got a while loop here, so a while true, and then just loop around until we get what we want and then return out if... So this is the place where I've got to try and decide if there's a better way of doing this or not. So get my input, which is two empty lines and then how much do you want to spend on your oxen team? loop around and then trying this again and again. So first off, take the user input. And if it is equal to, if it's greater than zero, if it's an integer greater than zero, and actually that's probably strictly speaking, not necessary there. But if it's greater than or equal to 200, if it's less than 300, then uh, we just return out of this function with, with that integer. Otherwise, we are going to say that, um, uh, we're gonna to have to prompt them based on what they actually did. If it was less than 200, we prompt them with not enough, it's great 300, prompt them with too much. And uh, this returns, this uh, get input returns whatever they returned and we'll go back around again, again and again. So, okay, that's, that's fine. But I want to try and make this a little closer to being functional if I can. So one option I've got here is, to have an initial oxen spend, get an initial thing, and then this thing is a recursive function. That's the difference here. This is a little bit more purely functional now. So this means that we've got our initial attempt, then go to this version where there's some user input to consider, do a check about the integer, take do a check about the value, and if it's good, then return it. Otherwise, we'll call this function again. And we have got ourselves. Um, an indefinite loop, not an infinite loop, but an indefinite loop, which is roughly what we want to carry on looping until the end goal is met. But there are some memory implications on this in C sharp. Now, C sharp does not support um, tail optimized recursion calls. It doesn't. It simply doesn't. Funnily enough, that does exist within the .NET runtime. The, the facility exists there. And F sharp has got tail optimized recursion calls. So you could do this in F sharp in some form and uh, you wouldn't run into memory problems, but in C sharp, you can't. Not well, to be honest, in this small example where, I mean, how many times are the user likely to actually try this until they either get the answer that's um, acceptable or um, they give up in frustration, throw the laptop uh, in the air and move on to, uh, to something more interesting. But either way, probably not that many loops, but still, there are memory implications of using recursion. So uh, I came up with this, which is not the perfect answer, but it's something that's that it worked for me. Once again, I'm having to make a compromise. So I created a function that I called iterate until, and that means iterate until a condition that I want is met. 
It's the second parameter of this function, and this is it. So I'm saying iterate until x, that is the input, is an integer, and it's between two and three hundred dollars. Until this condition is met, keep doing this. That is, keep trying again and again and again until we're happy. It does mean that um, the compiler actually doesn't quite recognize that we are guaranteed to be an integer input at the end, but that's a small consequence. But it does roughly work. But how this actually works under the surface, it's, it's a while loop still. It's still a while loop. This is just an inescapable reality of being a C-sharp developer. We can't really do um, large scale uh, recursive functions. So I've created a functional like interface, which works, but that's the best I can do. I have looked into other methods. Apparently it is theoretically possible to do some sort of very clever trick where you take the um, you take the intermediate language that C sharp compiles into after compile time and then do a little bit of monkeying around with it and then it is tail optimized recursion call. Sure, but that sounds like more work, work than it's actually worth. There is another option and that is to reference F sharp from within C sharp but apparently using it to that extent where you're doing lots of little calls all the time into the f sharp apparently there are some sort of problems with uh, with performance and so on with uh, that level of interaction back and forth so this unfortunately is just probably the best solution i've even discussed this with the with the microsoft.net team and this this was their conclusion as well so yes it's a compromise but at least i've again pushed it back so all the code that uses this interface at least can treat it as if it were functional and the interface itself appears functional so it's it's as good as we're going to get at least in the version of c sharp that we have available to us and the at the present so then that means the rest of those inputs they they can actually be genericized because they all have the same basic um, idea it has to be a non-zero spend so for each of those i'll just take the item name and um set that where i need it and then just get a non uh, a non-zero integer back and again i'll use my iterate until and this is the complete version of my um my inventory system this is to get a complete set of inventories so i um if i haven't previously gotten any inventory then get oxen and then here i'm saying uh work out which is the next item of inventory that you need that you which is the most recent inventory inventory you've got based on that then i know which item of inventory i need next and just loop around until so we've got everything. Once we've actually got ourselves um, a full set of uh, uh, of all the inventory spends that we need, then we'll return the whole thing, which is what we do here. We're doing an iterate until, and the iterate until is saying until the count is five. So this thing is going to be called five times, and each time we're going to end up with an updated uh, enumerable of inventory items, and uh, um, once that's met, we're fine, and we'll take the total spends. Now, here I actually am using a bit of recursion. I could have done this with another call to uh, iterate until, but do you know, this, to be honest, looks perfectly elegant to me, plus how many times, realistically, I mean, I can imagine them, the, the player taking a few duff attempts at trying to enter the correct number of uh, dollars spent on oxen. I can't imagine them going through the entire set of initial inputs that many times that we can't cope with a little bit of genuine recursion here so this is fine and we can make it into a dictionary which is one of my favorite things because it means that we can very easily uh just stitch all of these into the right place using the nice dictionary syntax i like dictionary syntax it's much nicer than using a, a dot single or a single or default from link this is much nicer um then the play. So the play is another instance of using iterate until. Now, I have actually created a very crude, simple monad here for continuing the game. I'm calling it continue game. So this, this isn't any particular uh, officially sanctioned monad, but this is something that I've created, which kind of operates on the same principle. 
It's just that the, instead of the switch being on something like um, was it invalid or whatever, it's more like uh, is the game over? And I'm doing an iterate until that is do this whole sequence of events again and again and again until do 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 game is over. Uh, and if game is over is ever set to true, then we come out of this thing. And each one of these has a similar switch inside it. It's uh, I'll show you that in a moment. But the turn sequence is start a new turn, select an action, do eating. How much do you want to eat? How well do you want to eat? There's a couple of random bits and pieces here now. There's probably slightly better ways I could have structured this, but I was trying to keep as close to the original basic code as I could, and they didn't really write it with very much of a consideration towards um, good code structure because, in large, because they couldn't. So I've just kept things where they belong. The, there might well be another version of this to be written someday in the future where I completely rethink the whole thing, uh, but for now, this is fine. And this is updating the total mileage, which is based on how far you've already traveled. Uh, see, here's the use of width. There we go, using a record there. So the, the X here is the game state. This is the game state, which initially is simply um, a whole load of zeros along with an initial inventory. And then each one of these is updating the state to a new state. State's a record, so we're just saying in every case, like width to say, create a new state based on the old one and uh, update it with these things. So this is saying update the mileage to be the old mileage plus all of this based on random numbers and um, how many oxen you have. And there's these flags that are based on you're passing through the mountains and there's a blizzard. Riders on the trail ahead, handle random events, cross the mountains if you have to. And then finally, we'll do the end game, which is a switch based on did you die, in which case you get the bad ending, or did you live, in which case here's the happy ending. That's what continue game looks like in the middle. What it's saying is, um, so given that I have got this state and a function which updates the state, then if the game is over or the player is dead, then return an unmodified state because we don't want to do anything anymore. Otherwise, take the function and run it. So going in this, uh, they're kind of monad-like. If the riders on the trail resulted in the player dead, then the random events and the cross of the mountain will not happen. Then we'll clearly hit game over here and then we will come to the end game. And since I spent an awful lot of time learning to draw, I am not going to waste any of the drawings that I did for the, the blog articles that started this. So these are a couple of little fair pieces of the system. Um, the first is the hunting mini game. So there was a hunting mini game, would you believe? in 1975 timeshare basic with with no flipping screen but they still had a hunting mini game now the way they did this was it would say uh type bang and you had to type b a n g as quickly as you could and if you mistyped then that was considered to be not a good hit and if you took too long same so it recorded the number of seconds at the time you started and the time you ended typing and then used that to determine how accurate you were if you typed it like within a second then um, you, you pretty much got a, a the best result every time and the gunshot was used in an awful lot of places around the game one is for hunting another is for fighting off baddies so i had to create a separate gunshot client for this one so i could share it around and that required a player interaction and time. This is again because I'm doing test driven development. So I am going to represent time as in the date time dot now object within C sharp for determining the current time with an interface, which is literally just a thin little wrapper for the date time object. But it just means I can inject my own times into my tests. Get the current time, get a, an input, passing them the message type bang, and then do a check to see whether it's a hit based on it's a text input and the uh, text is equal to bang. And then the way that the system worked was uh, uh, it, you always had a maximum of seven. Seven seconds is considered the worst hit you can have. So if they've taken more than seven, make it seven. And if they mistyped, also consider it seven. So then moving on to the riders on the trail ahead. Uh, I don't know if anybody recommend recognizes this guy here, 
the last few times I've done this talk, no one seems to, but that was from one of the great forgotten cartoons of the 1980s, Brave Star. I wonder what ever happened to that. Uh, everything else is making a comeback at the moment. Why can't we have Brave Star again? He was kind of awesome, especially this guy. So riders on the trail ahead. Uh, this was based on the idea that you, you see riders. Now, it was this was one of the most complex areas of the whole system. Whether there were riders or not was a probability um, judgment based on an incredibly complicated binomial equation, which made it more or less likely at various points of the route. Then, having determined whether they were riders, um, there was a, a role effectively of the dice to say, do they look friendly or do they look hostile? Then there was a further role to say, were you right? Were they actually friendly or were they actually not? Or vice versa, as, as appropriate. So there was a multi-step process and, and, every, and each one of these various branching outcomes um, had a different result in terms of how much ammo do you lose, how much mileage do you, do you gain or not, stuff like that. This is the section I spent the most of the time on trying to get the logic exactly right and uh, trying to understand properly the logic behind what they were even trying to achieve. And it's cut this period off the end there, but this equation is long and complicated. And that's used to determine what are the, it actually is generating a random number between zero and 10. And this equation is used to determine what's the, what's the boundary, how likely is it? Then if there are riders, then we're gonna do an encounter. Otherwise we're just gonna return the old state. Uh, unmodified and this is the rest of the logic as i say Ed, we have to consider multiple factors here were the ride well we know they're riders do they look friendly are they not what they seem now this was done with several nested if statements of the original i've tried to make it something a little bit easier for us to actually understand so i'm saying do the riders look friendly then are they not what they seem as in should we inverse whatever that was, and then given that, there we go, we've got the riders are actually friendly as a Boolean. This particular bit of logic in the original system was split in about four or five different locations. And then there we go, message to say, what do you want to do? Do you want to run, attack, continue, or circle wagons? Take an input, and then again, iterate until we get a valid input from them, as in an integer. That was the whole point of this discriminated union. With, uh, with my integer input as a type. Then up state, update the state based on were, was the rider friendly and what was the user's choice, the player's choice. And there we have a whole load of sets of updates to mileage, to bullets. Uh, a couple of situations were more complicated and needed their own sub functions, uh, quite often involving shooting uh, mini games. And then that finally was, goodness, yeah. This one took me a bit and I went through quite a few iterations of this entire function before I finally settled on this. And this actually kind of works. And that's my right conditional based on the riders were friendly or they weren't, or you have any ammo left. If you don't have any ammo left, sorry, you die. And uh, that's, the, that's where is dead comes in. If you wanted to shoot and um, you have no ammo left, well, that's it, game's over. So that's, that gives you a bit of a flavor of what my, my Oregon Trail game looks like. And this, is, this represents one of the bits I couldn't quite do yet. Now I've since heard this might be possible, but I'm not totally sure. This is again, a bit of um, um, original basic code. You see these comma sevens here. Now bearing in mind, this was literally printing in the original game as it existed. What this meant was, don't print this character, ding a little bell, ding. I don't know what it actually sounded like because I haven't found video of it, but it would type something like, Y-O-U, ding, space, finally, a right, ding, at or a ding, gun city. It, it wouldn't actually read the whole thing out, just the dings, but you get the idea. The point is, at various points, it would ring the little bell to say, hey, wonderful, you've done it, congratulations. Um, I'm not, I couldn't, at the time when I was writing this, I couldn't find a way to, uh, to do the little dings in a console, but someone tells me that there might actually be um, 
a code for that so that I watch this space I might have to remove this slide and actually put my dings in but even without the dings I think we can we can live without them because they're not that crucial even if they are a little cool so that's something I couldn't do at this point this is another idea this is one I would love to look at for another time this is another game from about the same time this is Star Trek would you believe one of the very first games possibly the first ever game based on Star Trek I don't entirely know what's going on here. It's some sort of combination of a management game and a combat simulation. This here is your map of um, the sector of space that you're in. And you've got various, so you, you type in a series of text commands which are parsed, and that determines what you did. And rather unlike Star Trek, I think what you had to do was fly around and blast things out of space, which doesn't seem very Star Trek-y to me, but there you go, that's how the game worked. Um, I think this little E inside the chevrons represented the Enterprise, and I have a feeling these guys are Klingons or something. Uh, some, something like that. I don't know, but still, it seems like a fun little bit of uh, nerd history, so I might well go back, and uh, the source code for this is around. I have seen it about, so I might have a go at trying to do this one. Uh, it sounds pleasantly slightly more complicated than what I've just done, so that probably, you know, that might be a nice follow-up. Now, another one is this. Uh, I am a massive fan of Doctor Who. It's the, uh, I don't know if you have it in Sweden, it is the uh, best TV series in the whole world. It actually is. It's, it's in the dictionary if you check. Best in the world. And uh, there was actually a text adventure game released in the 1980s. And that more might be a real challenge because the thing was actually written with so much data in it, so much uh, in the way of locations and so on that um it had to compress itself in binary form and then store the compressed binary and so when this game actually runs its source the first thing it does is uncompress itself in blocks and then run it so the source code is there i have a copy but it's not in a form that's actually readable so that one is going to take me quite a while to decode and if i wanted to go really wild i could do zork Zork is probably the first really astoundingly good text adventure game. So uh, if I want to get modern players eaten by a Gru or whatever, I might well have a look at Zork. And that is the point where we get into real, like, nice um, parsing of vaguely English-like sentences with the, with the advent of Zork. And also there was the Hobbit game from about the same time. But that was written in machine code, so that would probably also take a little while to get to uh, grips with. So finally... If anyone's interested in reading further about functional programming in C-sharp, I have a book coming out. Uh, I'm about halfway through writing it at the moment. That's about six chapters. I'm up to about uh, ooh, 150 pages and still going nicely. And in fact, I am after um, uh, people to help me with reviewing the content. So if anybody has any time to spare, I would absolutely love it if anyone could, could spare some time to have a look at the the um, the this early version for me to help me find any problems. I would actually, I was uh, I was chatting to uh, earlier that um, really I could absolutely do with someone who knows the functional theory really well. Even if you don't know C sharp, that's fine. But if you're really good with functional theory, I would love to talk to you because I just want to make sure that what I'm saying is absolutely right. The C sharp stuff I can get right, but the the functional theory stuff I would I would definitely love some help on that. But even if you just want to know more C sharp still would love to hear from anyone who wants to help me out and uh this uh this uh url here if you scan that thing there uh o'reilly passed me this it'll give you a, a month free on their website if you'd like to read the pre-release that's there otherwise it's uh, there's about 70 pages worth on their website of my book at the moment uh this is going to be hitting the shelves uh probably towards the end of next year thereabouts and before anyone asks, I do not know what my animal is. It's not that one. That's the one that everyone in pre-release gets. Apparently, it's a total black art, and nobody knows what the animal will be until you're pretty much ready to go to the shops. So I'm as eager to find out as everyone else. <laughs> okay, so are there any, any questions at this point? Yes. Hey. Thank you, Simon. Hey, thank you. Yeah, yeah hooray. 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 I have one question. Sure. And I think it came up here also in the in the chat. How many lines of code is the is the C sharp version version? Ooh. Ver, really ver, well. The basic. 
That's a really good question. I should probably look at that. I mean, I have the I have the source code over here, but the problem is the C sharp is, is like um, well, it's is further it code. Yeah, it's in it's in it's in classes and things. So mm. to be honest, your problem's going to be and um, that it's it's like it's a bit hard to count. I'm going to have to go through every single line. I mean, there's going to be a load more boilerplate involved because I've got things like interfaces and and so on. But I don't know. I mean, like my my riders on the trail is only about 120. Right, I can put that on the screen. Why not? There you go. This is it. Uh, my riders on the trail is only about 128 lines of code long, which is Trust me, it's a lot less fewer than the the original. Ooh, yep. um, let's see, random events is pretty long. There's loads of these. Wagon breaks down. Ox ninja's leg. There's loads of them. All very. This is one of the most morbid blocks of code I've ever I've ever written. Look at all this stuff. Thankfully, they don't all happen at the same time. There's a system for working out how many things happen. And actually, look, there's even a nice one there. Uh, this was written quite a long time ago. I don't think they'd called them Indians if they were writing it uh, in the modern day, but this was written in 1975, and I am remaining true to the original code, which is why I haven't updated the language. Especially confusing, as I'm literally married to an actual Indian from India. It's not one of those Indians. So this is only 200 lines long. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'd i vaguely guesstimate that I've probably made... I, I, I will... Before I do this talk again, I will find out how many lines of code, but I would vaguely Ooh. guesstimate I've probably halved the number of lines of code that exist at least. Yep. I think it's an awful lot shorter than it used to be just because of the amount of boilerplate that I've um, I've genericized. Oh, Ooh. I may as well leave that up, actually. That's my, uh, my Twitter again, if anyone wants to reach out. Do you, that's, that's an interesting question, though, and I'm going to find out the answer to that. Yep. Um, do, do we have any other questions? No, I... I don't have any other question i have a suggestion i like Ooh. put all the code in one file and you'll figure out the code the, the <laughs> amount of <laughs> yeah i could to be honest what i'm more likely to do is i'll probably write myself a little script yeah. and i'll probably just blast through every dot cs file and just tell it to tell me how many lines are cut you know just literally add up every single line I, i'll probably just write a little powershell script or something like that yeah. I, it'd probably Sounds easier it, 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 yeah, and plus it means coding, which always makes me happy. Is um, this open source in any way? Have you put it out on GitHub or any other place? I I will be. It oh. will be coming out on GitHub. Uh, I think I think there's a few error scenarios I found here and there that uh, I didn't quite get time to. I wrote this in time for presenting this talk at um, NDC Melbourne not long ago, and, and and I didn't see any kangaroos down there. I'm sad to say, a lot of parrots but no kangaroos, uh, apparently the wrong part of the country, which is a shame. But um, yeah, I, I think there were a few error scenarios I found that needed tidying up. So I might just like have a few goes at blasting through the code and make sure it's tight. And then I'm absolutely planning to put it out on um, uh, up on, on GitHub. I've got a GitHub account already and I'll add this to it. But yeah, good question. So look out for the source code. I'll watch my Twitter account. I'll probably announce it there once it's up. Uh, it's certainly a bit of fun. The game is actually surprisingly fun, to be honest. The, uh, there's some, <laughs> there is something, and even though it was rather crude, there is something strangely satisfying about the the B A N G typing mini game. It, if nothing else, it shows that I didn't waste my time all these years learning to type quickly, because <laughs> it means I never miss Oregon Trail. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, there is no there is no more questions on the chat. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I don't have any further questions. I would like to thank you for coming, and it was really interesting. Really cool. Thank you. Thank digging you. out old games and transforming them to new new codes. It's, this thank is the you. sort of this is the sort of thing I do when I'm stuck in a room with nothing better to do. Yes, the <laughs> government will give you a lockdown again, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> oh, don't. Once, mm. or twice, or three. How many times is sufficient? <laughs> <laughs> understand <laughs> okay thank you very much simon cheers cheers you're welcome and thanks everyone for joining us tonight and uh, thanks everyone for being active in the chat and we'll be back with the next meetup in september and if you have anything to present just reach out to me or anyone else in the organizer you can find them on meetup you can reach out to me on whatever social media you want to and uh, with that, thank you very much and uh, have a nice evening all. Goodbye.